Okay, thanks. Great to see everybody. Uh, thanks again to Mark and Josh for uh, inviting me. A great respect for Josh and his perseverance in making it here. Great to see him. And thanks to uh, Boston Sci for putting on a great uh, program. You'll notice none of us are talking about Boston Sci products, so they really have made a program for you, which is uh, great. Um, so I know after all these talks about entrainment and maneuvers, you know, biophysics sounds like, oh, it's time for me to check my Twitter feed and, and check up my email. It's kind of boring. But unfortunately, and I love entrainment. I love maneuvers. It's why I went into EP. But as fellows, you're probably going to spend a lot more time ablating than you will in training. And that's just with some of the complex substrates we deal with. Um, and I think it's not really taught well enough, these principles of what ablation is actually doing. So I'm going to try and take you through some of that. <coughs> Assuming my slides will go forward. Sorry, the clicker is not always faithful. But you <laughs> no problem. Conflicts. Not really relevant. So what I'm going to show you is our friend, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Do I need a different clicker? There. Uh, well, I'm going to go through, so RF ablation. I'm going to talk about some of the developments, and after that, larger tip catheter ablation. We'll talk about irrigated ablation, talk about cryo, and if we have some time, we'll mention some of the newer uh, energy sources that are coming. Now I made it too sensitive, so I'm going to go back one. Can we go back one? Another back another one? Also. Yeah, maybe I'll use this. So this is our friend, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Let's see if the laser pointer will work for me. Oh, wow, really sensitive. <laughs> Can I go back to again? I'll use the laser pointer. So again, remember that high frequency uh, radiation, things like x-rays pass through tissue. When we're ablating tissue, we want to heat it, right? Essentially, we want to heat the water in the tissue. So we're using generally lower frequencies. So for RF ablation, it's generally about 500 kilohertz, which is kind of somewhere between AM and FM. I think people don't always realize that it's a lower frequency uh, waveform. Again, laser ablation is also used, so that's more in the infrared uh, spectrum. But medical RF is about uh, 500 kilohertz. So when we ablate tissue, there's two uh, types of heating. First, there's resistive heating, and that is the myocardium that's directly in contact with the electrode, and that is heated directly. So it's the area of myocardium that is directly affected by the current flow. And then there is conductive heating, so just radiation of that central heat uh, outwards from the zone of resistive heating. The resistive heating drops off very quickly, so one over R to the fourth. So most of our conventional lesion with ablation is formed by conductive heating out from a central source. And that has some implications uh, that I'll talk about. This is just a uh, picture from the animal lab, LV, RV, and this is a lesion. So often you'll have a central zone of necrosis as well as a surrounding area of edema. Um, again, this area of surrounding edema will be electrically inactive but can recover. So what we care about is the zone uh, that's going to be electrically inactive. And I would encourage everyone, if they have the opportunity, uh, to do some ablation in an animal lab if you have one at your institution. I think we just get so blinded by saying, you know, on, on, on in the EP lab. And when you ablate and then you open the heart and you see the destruction that you've wrought, it just makes you much more sensitive, you know, especially in healthy tissue. Um, it's amazing the type of lesions that we're making and the amount of energy uh, and amount of lesions that we're giving these days. So it gives you some healthy respect for ablation, I think. Um, in terms of uh, temperature, so this is the temperature that we're heating the tissue to. So again, we know from work from David Haynes and others that you really have to heat the tissue to above 50 degrees Celsius to result in irreversible loss of excitability. So again, you can heat the tissue up a bit. It can appear inactive, but then it can recover. That's what we want to avoid. We want to try and get the tissue temperature above uh, 50 degrees. So this is, um, again, looking at standards of how ablation started, non-irrigated ablation electrodes. So for non-irrigated ablation, the temperature measured, and ideally the temperature at the electrode tissue interface, is proportional to the size of the lesion that you're going to get. So measuring the temperature uh, from the electrode is very important for estimating lesion size. So for example, if you heat with resistive heating the tissue interface uh, up to 80 degrees, that's going to then fall off 
with time with your conductive heating with space, and so you may end up with something like a 2.6 centimeter lesion. If you only heat to 60 degrees, that's going to fall off again to this sort of 50 degree mark where you get irreversible injury, and you'll end up with a smaller lesion. So again, for non-irrigated ablation, the temperature that you're heating the electrode to is actually very useful to gauge uh, the ablation size. Now keep in mind that you're not measuring tissue temperature, and in fact, with most catheters, you're not really measuring the electrode temperature, right? The thermistor is typically proximal to the electrode, so it underestimates the tissue temperature you're heating it to. And that's why you're not going to choose 90 degrees or 100 degrees. You're generally going to choose 60 or 70 because you don't want to heat uh, the tissue up too much. So again, to emphasize, uh, myocardial temperatures greater than 50 degrees are required for irreversible injury, and lesion size is proportional to the temperature at the electrode tissue interface. The reason you don't want to heat up above 100 degrees are two reasons. One is you start to get coagulum or clot on the tip of the catheter, and that limits your ability to heat the tissue. The second is what happens above 100 degrees is you're essentially boiling the water in the tissue. And if you do that inside the tissue, you get what's called uh, a steam pop. So let's see if we can, can we play this? And I think there's some audio too. This is actually in an animal lab. I borrowed this from Will Sauer. So did everyone hear that? And try to play it one more time. So that's a steam pop. And again, this is in a, a swine left ventricle. But what's happening is you're heating the water deep inside the, the endocardium. And that water boils. There's nowhere to go. That steam that's expanding and results in a mini explosion. Um, I always remember a case where I was ablating an alpha, a septal, fortunately, alpha track VT. It was difficult to induce, so the, the patient was really mostly awake. Um, and then we had a steam pop. And the patient says, what's that snapping sound? And uh, of course, I said, oh, that happens all the time. Don't worry. You know, <laughs> as I'm looking with echo to make sure. So if you're doing that on the free wall, I mean, you can easily perf and, and end up with an effusion or tamponade. So you want to avoid uh, steam pops, although, again, occasionally um, they happen. So again, the temperature of the ablation electrode, um, it's less than the tissue temperature, but serves as a good way to monitor lesion formation for non-irrigated ablation. Um, the other thing we use a lot is following the drop in impedance during lesion formation, which is a good uh, surrogate for lesion formation. So this is, again, an older study just looking at impedance drops and which drops led to no complications versus thrombus versus steam pops. And what you'll notice is if you keep the impedance drop generally under 10 to 12 ohms, it's, you're not going to get a steam pop. It's when you're getting uh, down to sort of 18 to 20. That's sort of the guidelines I tend to use in the atrium. And again, a lot of people don't pay attention to impedance, but I think it's very useful. Um, in the atrium, maybe 5 to 8 ohm impedance drop. In the ventricle, maybe 10 to 12. And if you want to get really deep, you might push it to 12 to 15. But if you see you're, you start dropping abruptly down to 18, um, that's where you want to either come off or back off on the power. Because if you keep coming down, that's when you'll get one of those uh, steam explosion. Question came up, why does the impedance drop during RF? So you're, you're changing the characteristics of the tissue, right? The tissue has uh, cells, that has water, and you're essentially drying out the cells and creating fibrosis, and so that uh, will decrease the impedance between the electrode and the tissue interface. Uh, this is just one of these slides. It's from Hiroshi Nakagawa, but just kind of shows us and, and in the past, again, with non-irrigated, we often did what's called temperature-controlled ablation. That means we set the maximum temperature, here 75. Again, we don't want to set it to 100 because we're underestimating the temperature of the tissue electrode interface um, because our thermistor is proximal to the electrodes. This is a four millimeter electrode. Temperature set 75 degrees. We're delivering energy, and we heat that electrode up to about 75 degrees. What's happening at that tissue electrode interface is about 75 degrees. And then it falls off with distance, 5841. So that here we know we're getting about a, a three millimeter lesion, uh, giving temperature controlled ablation. You'll notice um, the power here is relatively low, right? 10 watts. And then the system, when you're using temperature control, automatically is actually going to decrease the power to maintain this temperature. So you're actually giving a small amount of power and heating it up to 75 degrees to create uh, your lesion.
Now this is an example of thermal latency. So here what's happening is we're turning RF on for five seconds and you see the uh, tip, this is the temperature at the electrode uh, catheter interface. And then this is the temperature in the tissue with plunge electrodes at two millimeters, four millimeters, seven millimeters. So we're turning power on and then we turn power off. Um, and so what happens at two millimeters depth when we turn the power off, right? Because our lesion is forming mainly by conductive heating. So even though we've turned the power off, what happens to the temperature? It actually goes up before it starts going down, right? So that's why, I mean, we see this probably best example for AFib ablation is when we're heating the esophagus, right? You see the esophageal temperature go up, you turn power off, but it continues to go up because that conductive lesion is still forming. Um, so again, I think one of the important lessons of this is not to do a test burn. And even when I got to UC, I, someone was ablating near the right uh, cusp. And they're like, well, I'm just going to do a test burn for you know, 10 seconds and make sure nothing bad happens, and then I'll give a longer burn. Um, so you don't want to do that with RF. Again, cryo we'll talk about is a different issue. Um, but with RF, if you're near a structure, if you get heart block, if you damage a coronary, you turn the power off, the heat's still going up, and there's nothing you can do uh, to stop that. So you don't want to do a, a test burn. Um, the other thing that's important to realize is that the vasculature is not necessarily our friend when we're trying to uh, ablate. So this is from uh, Mark Wood, uh, and you know he's ablating here on the endocardium, and you can see the white is where the lesions formed, but inferior to this artery, you see preserved uh, tissue. And so that comes up a lot. You're trying to do, say, a mitral flutter, left mitral isthmus ablation. You've got the coronary sinus there. You've got the circumflex coronary artery there, and you can't get block. You're blading, ablating, ablating. Um, why can't you? It's because that blood circulating is essentially protecting the tissue underneath. And you really can't ablate without either uh, you can go to the other side. So often we'll use, let me see if I can get this pointer to work. We'll use. Uh, a catheter inside the coronary sinus, you're actually ablating on the other side of that isthmus, or there have been some studies where they actually inflate a balloon in the coronary sinus to block the flow. But you have to realize that if you're struggling, um, it may be because you're blocked by some uh, arterial structure. So, you know, because of some of these uh, limitations, larger RF electrodes are developed, which I'll just mention briefly since we don't use them so much, and then we'll talk about cool tip or irrigated RF ablation. So again, the early work from David Haynes uh, showed, so this is now electrode, the radius of the electrode uh, versus the diameter of the lesion, that obviously if you make that zone of resistive heating bigger, and then you have conductive heating from there, you're going to make your whole lesion larger. The key point of this, it's not necessarily on the slide, is that presumes that you're heating the tissue electrode interface to the same temperature. Right? So with a larger electrode, you may actually have to deliver more power to get to that same temperature, and then you're going to get a larger lesion with a larger electrode radius. Again, I just want to make that point. So here's 50 watts being delivered to a 4 millimeter catheter and an 8 millimeter catheter. If you're delivering the same power to a 4 millimeter catheter and an 8, eight millimeter catheter, here both perpendicular to the tissue, which is going to make a bigger lesion? Well, it turns out the four millimeter catheter is gonna make a bigger lesion. It's delivering more power to the tissue. Why is the lesion smaller with an eight millimeter catheter? Well, one, that power is now averaged over a bigger electrode. The other is you're losing more of that current uh, to the blood pool. So the main advantage of large electrode tip catheters is this passive cooling by the blood pool of the electrode that lets you deliver more power. So if you are using a standard four millimeter catheter, your generator will go up to 50 watts and then it stops, right? When you hook up an eight millimeter catheter, all of a sudden you'll notice it goes up to 80 or 100 watts. So why is that? So you have to deliver more power. Um, and again, initially when people started doing a fib ablation with an eight millimeter catheter, which I would not recommend, um, I saw people using 30 watts with an eight millimeter catheter and you're really you know, making tiny lesions. So it's not the eight millimeters that all of a sudden is more powerful. It's the fact that you have this uh, passive cooling from the blood pool uh, that's cooling your electrode, and therefore uh, you can deliver more power to get a larger lesion. 
The other thing to realize with these 8-millimeter catheters is they're more susceptible to orientation. So with a 4-millimeter, there's slight differences, but if you're parallel or perpendicular, there's not as much difference in the delivered power. Whereas here, if you're parallel, you're delivering energy over a longer area, and you may make a, a longer uh, lesion, you're delivering more power, and there's also edge effects at the edge of the electrode where you may get some uh, char. So let's, you know, so I think nowadays we've moved from occasionally for a flutter, um, maybe some people still are using eight millimeters, but mainly we're using irrigated RF electrodes. So that means the electrodes have saline running through them that's cooling the electrode while you're ablating. And again, the main reason to do that is it lets you deliver more power safely uh, to the electrode tip in areas of low flow. So that's the main advantage of irrigated electrodes. It's the ability to maintain power in area of low blood flow. There's also uh, a lower risk of thrombus formation, because now you're with open irrigated catheters, which are most of the ones we're using, um, you're also irrigating the tip of the catheter and preventing thrombus formation. But again, the other main, one of the key points I want to emphasize is the lesion size isn't necessarily bigger with an irrigated versus a non-irrigated catheter. It's just the power delivery. So if you're trying to ablate a left lateral accessory pathway with a standard four millimeter catheter, and you're delivering 50 watts, and that pathway is not going away, I've heard people say, well, I'm gonna switch to an irrigated ablation catheter, because that's more powerful. Well, guess what? If you're delivering 50 watts with, a, with an irrigated or non-irrigated, it's still 50 watts, and your lesion is the same size. Maybe you can stay on longer because you're not heating the tip and getting char, but for the same duration and power, you're getting the same lesion size. If, on the other hand, as with that uh, picture I showed earlier, you're delivering 10 watts, but your temperature is shooting up to 70 degrees with a non-irrigated catheter, well, that's when switching to irrigated ablation will help because now you can cool the tip and deliver more power where you were temperature limited before. So for any constant RF power, lesion size and depth is the same as with a non-irrigated electrode, again, for the same power and duration. The one thing you lose with irrigated ablation, because now you're cooling the tip of the catheter, is that temperature from the thermistor is no longer a surrogate of lesion size, right? Because now you're cooling the tip. So temperature really then is just, it's a safety marker. If the temperature is shooting up, it means something's wrong. It means either your, your holes on your electrode are plugged, or maybe your tubing's disconnected, or you're really in a low flow area, but it's not really useful in terms of lesion size. Can I just ask one quick clarifying question? Yeah. This has come up twice here. What is more important in making a lesion, higher temperature or higher power? So it's, a, it's a, there's, you know, not one or the other. Uh, and it depends. So again, with non-irrigated ablation, um, temperature is, is a useful surrogate, um, and, and the power also has, is, is a factor, um, but temperature is probably more useful. With irrigated ablation, the temperature is not useful at all, and then it's how much power that's generally going to going to make your lesion, if that, if that makes sense. So again, just showing some examples. So this is curve. So A is four millimeter non-irrigated 20 watts. So you're heating the tissue electrode interface. That's falling off with time. You're making, say, a three and a half millimeter lesion. Now you irrigate that electrode, but give the same 20 watts. This is curve B. The temperature isn't useful anymore, right? That's cooler. But essentially, you're getting the same size lesion. Now what if you crank that up to 50 watts? By, you know, with an irrigated four millimeter catheter. Well, that's C. So you're, you're irrigating it, you're giving much more power, and notice what happens now. You're heating up, you're cooling the surface, but you're heating the tissue up at depth. And this is another main uh, pitfall of irrigated ablation, is you don't know now what your temperature is, but you could be heating above 100 at depth, and that's where you get a steam pop. So whereas temperature was useful with non-irrigated ablation to prevent steam pops, with irrigated ablation, temperature is not so useful. You have to monitor other things like impedance drop um, to avoid steam pops. But you can see now this lesion radiates out, and you end up with a huge uh, lesion. Sorry, this temperature radiates out. So you end up with a much bigger lesion because you can deliver uh, more power. So this is irrigated RF, the same setup. You're delivering energy. again. The, the electro temperature is maintained at about 40 degrees, so that doesn't heat up because you're cooling it. Here's the uh, electro temperature, the interface, 
uh, of the electrode and the tissue. So you're heating the tissue up on the surface to 70 degrees, but again, at three and a half millimeters, you're heating it up to 100, and then it falls off. So that's where you can get boiling uh, and a steam pop. And again, this is just showing this in a thermogram. So when you're heating the tissue the hot, with non-irrigated ablation, the highest temperature is at the tissue electrode interface. With irrigated ablation, you're cooling the tissue. So the highest temperature is deep, um, and that's where you can get a steam pop. There are some who advocate, advocate, advocate for AF ablation, actually turning off the irrigation, because you don't want to heat deep to the esophagus, and you don't want to preserve the endocardial layer. You want to ablate that. So maybe this is a better model. Um, I haven't done that. Again, I think the lesion size is the same at the same power. So you just have to be aware of it. Um, and that the biggest thing to be cautious with with irrigated ablation is these steam pops from heating uh, deep to the electrode interface. So this is steam pops from a Bill Stevenson uh, paper with irrigated RF. So again, when he kept the impedance drop to less than 10 ohms, they never had a steam pop. Over 18, um, about 80%. So again, I try and keep it for the ventricle 10 to 12. If you're getting a big drop and you're hitting 18, 20 ohm drop, that's where you come off or start backing off on the power. Um, you know, it's not just all 50 watts. I usually start at 25, 30 and ramp up and keep an eye on the impedance. This is a slide that was from a while ago. It's a catheter called Voyage Medical that had a camera on the end. Unfortunately, the company went belly up, but it was a nice way to see um, contact. So, you know, you're looking at fluoro, you're feeling the catheter, and boy, you feel like you're in great contact. You can see the lesion forming. This is the electrode, and this camera's in another catheter. You can see the white tissue heating, but you can see, you know, your catheter's moving a lot more than you realize. I mean, you remember, the heart's beating, patients are breathing, they're moving around, and, you know, really got us to appreciate the importance of contact as a component of making lesions. And uh, this has been shown nice by Hiroshi Nakagawa. So, at any given power, if you increase the contact force between the electrode and the tissue, and you're embedding the electrode into the tissue, uh, you'll get a, a, a larger lesion. So this is two grams, 20 grams, you get up to 50, 60 grams. Because you're embedding that electrode in the tissue, you're gonna get a larger lesion. Again, fifth, this is different powers. So it's when you have both high power uh, and high contact force that you're at the highest risk of creating uh, steam pops. You know, a lot of the catheters have evolved from kind of the simpler six end hold irrigation to multi uh, poured irrigation where the whole tip of the electrode is being cooled. Uh, the main advantage of this is it really keeps the temperature constant and lets you deliver whatever power you want. Um, but again, you have to be cautious. I think when people started using these electrodes, they said, oh, you know, they're not safe because I've had more, more perforations, more steam pops. Well, it used to be, you know, if you were ablating in an area of low flow, like below, say, the right lower pulmonary vein, you still would be somewhat temperature limited. So you'd be hitting 40, 45 degrees, and the system would ramp down your power. Now these electrodes just sit at, at 28, 30 degrees, and if you're pouring in 50 watts to thin tissue, that's when you can have a problem. So you just have to watch your electrogram, impedance, and um, other things that we'll uh, talk about. Now this is off, some off-label uses when you're struggling and want to really you know, optimize um, depth of lesions. So bipolar ablation has been reported. Remember that standard ablation is unipolar, right? You're ablating between the tip of your catheter and a reference patch that's on the back, typically, or leg of the patient. Um, so people have described, this is from Vivek Reddy and Jacob Carruth, uh, bipolar ablation. So instead of serial unipolar ablation, so here you're ablating on one side of the tissue and the other, what bipolar ablation does is it's ablating between two catheters that are on either side of a structure like the septum or endoepi. What the advantage of that is conductive heating. Now that you're heating from both sides simultaneously, uh, you're more likely to get a larger transmural lesion. So again, in this study, uh, transmural lesions with unipolar were about 30%, but with bipolar, about 80%. So you have to sort of hotwire the system to do that, um, but bipolar ablation is one trick. Uh, this is just the case where we had a, a desummit VT, so we have one catheter in the RV uh, alpha tract septum and the other retrograde in the left side, 
you could see they're kind of kissing each other in RAO and just opposite in LAO. And then we did bipolar ablation was the only way we could get this VT after trying uh, everything else that we could try. The other perhaps easier way uh, of optimizing your ablation lesions when you have a deep uh, exit or VT that you can't get to was been shown nicely by uh, Will Sauer and, and Dewey in the group at Colorado, uh, which is just to use half normal instead of normal saline as the irrigant for your ablation catheter. Um, so again, when you irrigate, remember that with this saline that's leaving the electrode tip, you're losing some of that current to the blood pool. When you use half normal instead of normal, it's, what it's doing is reducing the ionic current that's leaving the electrode, so it puts more energy into the, into the tissue. Um, and in these preclinical studies, and we published a paper with uh, Will looking in clinical studies, you get about a 30% larger lesion, and you can definitely terminate some VTs that you couldn't terminate um, with normal saline. So it means you have to just tell the nurses who are hooking up the bags to change the bag that's irrigating the ablation catheter from normal to half normal. And when I started doing this, though, it was like, it seems like it takes an hour for the pharmacy to mix half normal. Like, no one has half normal anymore, so we have a couple of bags of half normal for this purpose. And then when you're done with that, you want to change back to, to normal. You don't want to leave it that way. But it's, a, it's even easier than bipolar. It doesn't take special setup. Again, it's off-label. But if you're really struggling with a deep septal VT, it's another approach. Now, the other approach people are using now, I'm going to talk about more for, for atrial ablation, um, is this so-called HPSD, or high-power short-duration lesions. So was, as we said initially, our standard ablation um, was, was kind of weighted towards conductive heating, small amount of resistive, and most of the lesion was formed by conductive heating. Now what we don't want in AFib ablation is to injure posterior structures like the esophagus. So the idea here, at least, is by doing a very high power but short duration lesion is we're maximizing resistive heating, that initial lesion, and getting less uh, conductive heating and less depth. But importantly, it's not binary. Um, you're still gonna get some conductive heating when you heat tissue. So the idea is like here, you're gonna get a wider, shallower lesion. This is just showing a standard uh, you know, low power, 30 second duration line versus the high power, you get a much more impressive, contiguous uh, lesion. But I have heard people say, wow, I'm using this 50 watts in the posterior wall, and the esophagus is really heating up quickly. So again, it, it's not going to go away, your conductive heating. Um, you still can, but you, know, you still can heat up deep structures. Uh, so I would be a little careful with that. But it, is, it does certainly, I mean, I don't know if, Brad, if you're doing this, but um, it does speed up procedures. I think there's still, we need more data, but it does seem to shorten procedures. It seems to be uh, safe and hopefully similar efficacy, uh, but I think we need some more data. Um, just people always ask after this talk, well, what settings do you use? And again, I think another thing um, you'll see, and I don't want you to memorize the slide, but it's more the concept, is these lesion indexing parameters that most of the ablation systems now have. So they, what they do is integrate things like power, duration, and contact force and give you an index of your lesion size. So with this one system's ablation index, for example, um, as you go higher, it's been shown in preclinical studies, you get a larger, deeper lesion. So you can use that, again, as opposed to just sort of guessing by the power you're delivering and the time. You can use that to index your lesion. So um, again, if you're using this high power, I tend to maybe go sometimes down to 40 in the posterior wall, but higher power, shorter duration. There's one system that uses, it's called LSI, lesion size index. Um, so on the anterior wall, the ridge of the left atrium, uh, I tend to go five and a half to six, and maybe four and a half to five in the posterior wall. The other system uses this ablation index. Uh, I tend to use 450, 500 on the thicker parts, and maybe 300 to 350. Again, you don't have to worry about the numbers, but just realize as you're doing these cases and watching your attendings that these are other systems that are, these are parameters that I think are very helpful to make the ablation hopefully safer and uh, more efficient. So in terms of the RF summary, uh, again, tissue injury occurs reproducibly at a temperature of about 50 degrees. With non-irrigated ablation, RF lesion size proportional to electrode radius, the tip temperature, and the delivered power. Larger tip electrodes allow more delivered power due to greater cooling by the blood pool, but you need to give more power. 
Irrigated RF allows greater delivered power and therefore larger lesions um, and hopefully safer lesions by cooling at the electrode tissue interface. But again, lesion size is no different with the same delivered power using non-irrigated or irrigated RF. Greater contact force is generally going to give you larger lesions. If you're struggling, again, you've mapped, you know where you're trying to ablate, but it's deep. Things that you can do to enhance uh, lesion formation, bipolar RF, half normal saline irrigation, um, or again, if you're over the esophagus or a deep structure you want to avoid, um, a high power short duration lesions are another uh, kind of different approach. Can I ask just a couple follow-ups about RF before you go to cryo? Um, many questions about, again, power versus temperature. Some are dealing with how do you set the RF generator? Is it power controlled or temperature controlled? And how do you decide how to direct the RF generator to deliver energy? Yeah, so you can set it either way. Again, I would say the majority of the ablation we're doing these days is irrigated. So temperature uh, controlled isn't going to be helpful other than as a safety. So I'll usually set the max temperature to something like 45 degrees, uh, you know, again, know, knowing that usually will be 32, 31. But it's not temperature controlled ablation. It's only there so that if there's some problem where the, the, the pores are plugged or buried and that catheter is heating up, then you want to come off. Uh, but it's not really, but typically it's uh, what I typically do is power controlled ablation. So you, you set the power that you're using and you titrate that based on these indexes, including imp impedance. And again, you don't have to start with 50 watts. So I'll often start with 30, you know, again, assuming it's VT, um, and then look at the impedance drop, and I'll often titrate up and make sure I don't come down too steeply or, or too shallowly. So most of the ablation we're doing these days is power controlled um, because it's non-irrigated. For like AVNRT uh, or a right atrial TAC, I might still use a non-irrigated four millimeter catheter. Um, and then Again, uh, I'll set a max, it's sort of a mix. I mean, I'll set a max temperature, uh, and, and it's more of a, and, and usually you set the power fairly high, 40, 50, so it's more of a temperature controlled ablation. You can set it uh, either way, but for an irrigated ablation, it's generally power controlled. Uh, for non irrigated, again, you can titrate the power, but it's more temperature controlled on average, I would say. There is a question about a seeming contradictory statement. Initially, you said that blood flow was helpful in terms of RF delivery by cooling the tip, but then when you were talking about the mitral isthmus and coronary sinus, you said blood flow was harmful yeah, to making okay. a lesion. That's, so that's a good point. So the, the blood flow in the cavity itself that's directly surrounding the electrode is helpful um, with larger electrodes because it's cooling the electrode. Um, the blood flow through the vasculature uh, and obviously, you, don't, you, you can occlude blood, blood vessels with RF. So in the myocardium, if you have an artery, that will limit the depth of penetration through that artery because you have blood flow that's keeping um, the area below from heating up. So I'm talking about blood flow in the cavity itself versus vessels that are going through the myocardium. It isn't going to half normal saline the same as just increasing the power? Why don't you just do that? Yeah, it's a good question. So generally, you're going to do that when 50 watts isn't working. So it doesn't make sense, I agree, to do you know, 25 watts with half normal saline. If, if 50 watts, you still can't penetrate enough, you know, you've got a summit VT, then we'll change to, to 50 with half normal saline. I'll also mention, because people often ask, you know, can you use D5W? Uh, you can, but you'll get a lot of steam pops with that. So I would, I would just be careful. Um, in the preclinical studies, there are a lot of steam pops with D5W. So half normal seems to be a sort of more effective but safe balance. And maybe I'll just the last question is to clarify why do you get deeper lesions when you use half normal versus normal saline? Yeah, so again, you have to think of part of the energy that you're delivering is being lost to the blood pool by the irrigant. And normal saline, and I had to you know, read this, and they talk about it with Will, but normal saline is higher ionic content, so you're losing more energy. When you use half normal, you're losing less energy to the blood pool, so then where does that energy go? More of that current goes into the tissue as opposed to being, being lost to the blood pool. Okay. Ten minutes. Um, so I'll just briefly go through cryo, because again, I think it is an important energy so source. So as opposed to RF, cryo works obviously uh, by freezing. Um, when you put the, get the tissue below zero degrees, you know, it's simple. You form ice crystals in the cells. The cells rupture and die. So 
um, your ablating cells by freezing as opposed to heating. You know, the advantage of cryo is you have the same thing with RF, we said you have conductive heating. With cryo, you have conductive cooling. But there's a leading edge here that isn't quite below zero degrees. So it will have an effect of, of reversible uh, inactivation of the tissue without killing the tissue. So this is one of the big advantages is your central core is frozen and will be irreversibly uh, you know, inactivated or killed. But you have a leading edge which is hypothermic but not damaged. So that, for example, with a parahisian pathway when you want to um, you know, very carefully ablate a structure but not damage adjacent structures, if you see heart block and turn off cryo, that heart block can recover if you do it quickly enough. You can, you can ablate the AV node with anything. Um, but again, if you're careful, you have more uh, sensitive when you have adjacent structures that you want to be cautious with. Um, you have more leeway with cryo because you have that leading edge where you're going to see an effect um, but not destroy the tissue, as opposed to RF where the energy keeps going up and then comes down. So the advantages of cryo, one is the cryo sticks to the tissue. So it's the one case where once you come on, you know, the fellows can let go of the catheter and I won't yell at them. With RF, occasionally the fellow will sort of be relaxed and let go and like, what are you doing? Hold on to the catheter. Um, with cryo, it sticks to the tissue and so you don't have to hold on. And that again can be useful when you're on, say, the annulus where there's a lot of movement. Um, people have described for papillary muscle VT, where you often contact is poor, um, it sticks to the muscle, and once you get below zero degrees, it stuck. So that's one advantage. The reversibility, um, and again, perhaps preservation of tissue architecture compared to RF. Obviously, it depends on the power, but in general, with a four millimeter cryo versus four millimeter RF, you're going to get a smaller volume uh, lesion. So some of the initial studies for AV and RT showed a higher recurrence rate than RF. So most people nowadays, when you're targeting uh, a clinical, whether it's AVNRT or a parasympathetic pathway array attack, will use a six millimeter catheter just because you get a bigger lesion. For eight millimeter, you need actually a bigger sheath. It's an it's eight and a half, you need a nine French sheath. So most of us, I'd say, are using uh, six millimeter focal uh, cryocatheters. And again, this is just a slide showing less intimal disruption in thrombus with cryo compared to RF. Cryo balloon has gotten to be very commonplace for AF ablation. It's obviously quicker. It's a balloon that's infused with nitrous oxide, so it freezes uh, the tip of the balloon and then freezes around the pulmonary vein. Again, in this case, we're using conductive cooling, so we have a temperature at the interface. And again, studies have shown to get that temperature less than 10 degrees at 5 millimeters takes about uh, 120 to 160 seconds. So typically, with cryoballoon, people are doing 180 second or three minute freezes to try and get to that uh, depth, five millimeter depth. Remember, the temperature you're measuring is at the interface of the uh, surface, not the interface. I mean, you're measuring the interface at the surface of the balloon, but what you care about is the interface at the tissue level. So again, even though you're getting down to minus 50, you may only be minus 10 at the tissue. If you're getting into those levels where you're um, not quite below, that's where you can have irre you know, reversible tissue injury. So the temperature you're dropping to isn't necessarily the temperature at the uh, tissue interface. So cryoballoon kills cells via ice crystal formation. The lesions are generally smaller than a four millimeter RF, tap, RF catheter, but the depth is similar. Again, most people are using six millimeter tip for focal clinical applications. Cryoballoons used very widely now for um, P pulmonary vein isolation. The advantage is reversibility, less thrombus, preservation of tissue architecture. So I'm just going to briefly mention um, some newer energy sources. I took out slides on laser because I just figured I made the talk too long, but laser balloon is now an approved method for uh, pulmonary vein isolation. It's not used very commonly, but you may see that uh, in some of the labs. There are some slides on that in the end of the talk if you have questions and want to just look at it. Um, ultrasound has been used. We did some work with epicardial HIFU or high intensity focused ultrasound. There's also another system looking at LIKU, uh, low intensity ultrasound for AFib ablation. So you may hear about these. There were uh, microwave catheters, and there's some microwave catheters in development. And I just wanted to say one word about electroporation, because I think it's something you're going to be seeing more of in the future. Uh, so this was the first in man study from Vivek Reddy that was presented at Heart Rhythm. 
So it's electroporation, it's almost like DC ablation. It's many short microsecond pulses of, uh, of electric field that ablates tissue by creating pores in the cell membrane. As I think Gordon mentioned, oncology drugs being used in EP, I mean, this was used in oncology to treat tumors. Um, you could either cause reversible electroporation to, to transfect viruses into the tumor or irreversible to basically destroy the cell, the cell contents would leak out. So this sort of flower ca catheter delivers, I mean, this is over five beats delivering a biphasic uh, electroporation pulse. And at least in early studies, what they found was that three months, 100% of the pulmonary veins were durably isolated. And I think it's finally one area we got lucky, right? We're, we always deal with the esophagus right behind the left atrium. Why is that there? But in this case, it seems that the esophagus and nerve is less sensitive than myocardium to electroporation. So they had no injury to these structures. So I've seen a lot of energy sources come and go, but I, I really do think you like the last group of fellows where you know, we'll be saying, remember the days where you used to move a catheter around the left atrium and it took three hours? Um, this, all this pulmonary vein isolation, three minutes of ablation time, and the procedure time was an hour and a half, including all the mapping and first in man. So I think this is something, if it proves uh, safe, that uh, will really be a modality of the future, at least for AFib. Um, so we'll see how that un unravels. And um, I'll stop there. Happy to take any more questions. So thank you. Um, uh, there were uh, a lot of questions just to <laughs> clarify about irrigation. Uh, here's uh, one example. Uh, why, do you, why should you use irrigated ablation if the temp that you're recording is unreliable, but the temperature recording seems to be the best predictor of tissue injury? So again, the main reason we use irrigated ablation, well, one is some potential safety benefit because you're less likely to get char because you're irrigating the tip of the catheter. But the main reason is often you'll find that, you know, the heart isn't uh, a completely smooth structure, right? There's pectinates, there's nooks and crannies. So if your electrode is buried in a nook or cranny, you'll be given a tiny bit of power and it'll heat up and, and will limit the amount of uh, power you can give to deliver an effective lesion. So when that's the case, again, you give 10 watts, you're heating up to 60 degrees, and you, you, you want as you get char at the interface and you can't give as, mu as much power, is by irrigating the electrode interface, uh, you're able to deliver higher power. That's the main reason. I mean, there's other reasons now. Sometimes we use these catheters just because they're later, they have contact for us, whereas others don't. Um, but again, the main reason is to be able to have the flexibility, if you need it, uh, to deliver more power to the electrode. And maybe one last one um, about uh, using ice to prevent steam pops by seeing echogenic changes in the tissue before the steam pop happens. What's going on that you can see that, and is that a reliable way to avoid steam pops? Yeah, that's a good question. And there were actually some early papers, you know, talking about the different types of microbubbles. So you can see type one and type two. Um, I, I think ice is useful. So, particularly in the ventricle, I always use ice, intracardiac echo, and you can see the the echolucency of the tissue. I should probably add some slides with that, where the tissue becomes white, and if that happens very quickly. Um, or if you start to see some microbubbles coming out of the tissue, that is a sign to come off. Um, so that is useful, I think, when you're, when you're um, about to get a steam pop. But I can tell you, sometimes it'll happen and you, don't really, you can't really see it ahead of time in ice. And with AFib ablation, you, know, you have to be constantly moving the ice to always be in that plane uh, to see exactly what that, where that lesion is forming. So it's hard to do that while you're ablating. So I think I don't use it for you know, every lesion or AFib. I think in VT, where you're trying to sit on a pat muscle uh, or you know, you're, you're really trying to heat an area, it's useful, but it's hard to use well because you have to be moving the ablation catheter with one hand and the ice with the other hand and, um, and, and keep them in the same layer. But I, I think you certainly, one is it gives you a good surrogate that you're making lesions. When you see that tissue whitening, you know you're making a decent lesion. Um, it's useful to make sure you're not getting a steam pop. I still find impedance probably more useful just on average. <laughs>